I am reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, from verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. I want to call my topic today, The Power of a Mother's Influence. Although we are honoring mothers today, it is my prayer that this word will speak to all of us here, that this word will speak to our hearts and to our life with God, because within the space that we function in, each day, wherever we live, wherever we operate and move, and uh, that space we exist in every day of our lives, uh, we have the power to influence uh, the people and the dynamics present in that space uh, within which we operate uh, and share together. So today, I think that it is only appropriate for us to examine the biblical gift of motherhood. And I want to remind us that biblical motherhood is not limited, is not restricted to just natural motherhood only. Now, in this high-powered, high-pressured, corporate climbing the ladder society, we live in today, I believe that anyone who is desirous of uh, seeking success in anything in life uh, would agree with me when I say that one of the most critical keys to being a success in life, especially today, is to know how to master the art of making a good first impression. If you want to do anything well, you've got to learn how to put your best face on and, uh, you know, package yourself in such a way so as to impress uh, those who are meeting you for the very first time. Now, I have discovered that a second chance is usually dependent on your first impression. Truth be told, no matter what you may be doing, whether you are being interviewed for a new job, or auditioning for some new role somewhere, vying for a place at college or at, at university, or even going out on your first date, whatever it may be, you know how important it is for you to make a good first impression. That's why you get your hair done, 
That's why you iron your shirt and polish your shoes. That's why you try to get everything right. You dress the impress. You practice your answers uh, before the interview. But because you know that when you sit down, you realize that you've got to make a good first impression. And uh, how true really is the cliche that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. The doors of opportunity, they seldom remain open for those people who do not know how to present themselves uh, and to present their best in order that people may, might believe in their possibility and in their potential. As a matter of fact, some of you may have fallen victims and you have been hoodwinked by people who have just they have just put on a good impression a good first impression and uh, that happened despite the fact that you had more going for you than they had going for them at that interview so you have to resign yourself to the fact that uh, you never get a second chance to make a first impression now if you agree, if you agree with me that first impressions are critical to how we move and navigate through life, and that first impressions are critical to how people see us and respect us and what they believe that we are able to do, then I'm suggesting to you right now that what is recorded in John's Gospel chapter 2, what I read a while ago, is both confusing and curious. The Bible says that that was the first miracle that Jesus uh, did. And that is why, personally, uh, I find it confusing. So, here he is. Jesus, God's Son, the Savior of mankind. And the very first impression that Jesus makes on the world is through a miracle where he turns water into wine. And uh, to be honest, that's kind of problematic with a lot, a lot of Christians. Problematic to all religionists believers and leaders alike uh, who would have been more comfortable if Jesus had turned wine into water instead of the other way. But turning water into wine, you know, and besides, uh, you are looking at Jesus' inaugural miracle. That does not make a good first impression to most of us and that's not all look at the place where he goes to make that first impression to the whole wide world he goes down to a little town called cana of galilee there is no mention absolutely no mention of cana in the old testament and nowhere else in the bible do you ever read about Cana? Cana is no historic town. There is no great synagogue in Cana. There is no great temple in Cana. There is no significance to Cana whatsoever. All we know is that Cana is in the northernmost part of Israel and it is a barren land. Nobody goes to Cana. No tourists pass through Cana. It is neither a port city nor is it some kind of trading harbor. There are no Pharisees in Cana. 
There is no Sanhedrin council there in Cana. There is no Samaritan woman in Cana. There is no Roman centurion in Cana. In fact, there is absolutely nobody in Cana uh, that Jesus would could, could impress. Nobody there to impress. Uh, yet, he does his very first miracle and uh, gives the very first impression in that place called Cana. And notice, uh, he does not do it in some spiritual place. He does not do it in church. He does not do it at some revival meeting. He does it at a wedding. Now, since we are all stuck in a, you know, 21st century, 2020 kind of definition of what wedding is, let me take a moment to take you back to a wedding at the time when Jesus lived. In those days, uh, weddings, they were not spiritual events. They were social events. Social. A wedding then was a seven-day party. Yes, you heard me right. Party. And the host would normally invite as many people as possible to uh, the wedding because such an in uh, such an undertaking uh, would bring great great honor to that family and uh, it is also well known uh, in middle eastern culture then uh, that uh, um uh, what was greatly celebrated in that culture was um the laws of hospitality Yes, because it was very well institutionalized, very well established. I'm talking about hospitality. Yes. So, and when one were to take the laws of hospitality and join it together with the laws of neighborhood, which was very, very real uh, at that time, the importance that was assigned to hospitality at a great social occasion, a great social event like a wedding, made it something not only beautiful and pleasing and pleasurable, but it added a kind of mystery to the whole social event as well. So an invitation to a wedding, a great, great social event, spoke volumes uh, not only uh, about the greatness of the favor that was being extended uh, to, by the host but also you know the sanctity of the, the guests who um, they would uh, uh, enjoy full and unconditional blessings of uh, the host uh, everything that his house had to offer. So a wedding in Jesus's time would have been a high octane status thing, a serious, serious seven day party of eating and drinking. They took the thing real seriously. Now, attending the wedding, we are not talking about church people here. We are not talking about Bible quotas here. It's not the hallelujah crowd. It's not the ones who answer their phones, praise the Lord. These are common villagers. They are people, friends, family who have come to this wedding from far and from near. These are people who have come to eat. <laughs> they didn't come to church. They didn't come to pray. They have come to eat. They have come to drink. They have come to be merry and to have a good time for seven whole days. And uh, here it is, here in this kind of setting, that Jesus chooses first to be present 
to accept the invitation to the wedding and also to introduce himself to the whole wide world. Now, when we compare, you know, this miracle of turning water into wine, and you compare them to all the other miracles that Jesus did, we can safely say that there's nothing about this miracle where we can readily say that it gives glory to God. And uh, from where we sit as Bible students, this miracle does not seem to exemplify all that Jesus is. No. Now, here is a man who would go on to do great, great things, uh, you know, uh, on the earth, great things in his ministry. Yet, he chooses to introduce himself to the whole world by turning water into wine. Yes, wine, something as sensitive as wine is even to many Christians today. A lot of believers today. Now, let me confess. If it was me, the Savior of the world, I certainly, as uh, you know, my first impression that I want to give, I certainly would have started with raising Lazarus from the dead in order to give a better first impression of me. I may have, you know, um, that is what I would have, may have started with. And by that, people, they certainly would have known who they were dealing with. Or maybe I may have started with walking on water. So nobody, absolutely nobody would misunderstand who I really was. Maybe I may have started by opening blind eyes. So people would know that I had the power to heal. But turning water into wine, Hmm. probably low, low, low down my list or probably not at all because what glory does God really get out of something like that? There's no hidden kingdom message in it. No, no. There's no theological significance in turning water into wine and to press the issue a bit further, this may be considered to be the most unremarkable of all the miracles that Jesus did because whenever you read about Jesus in all of the Gospels, he is always referred to or he is always referred by something which he did, like isn't he the one who raised Lazarus from the dead? Isn't he the one who fed 5,000 plus people with five barley loaves and two fishes? Isn't he the one who opened blind Bartimaeus' eyes? But nowhere, nowhere, nowhere in the gospel account does anyone say, that is Jesus the guy who turned water into wine. There's absolutely no reference to this miracle as some kind of an identifying mark of the supreme miracle working power of Jesus Christ. So why use this miracle to make your first impression? Why would Jesus want to introduce himself by turning water into wine and, uh, I mean, to boot at a party? I believe that Jesus did it simply because of the power of a mother's influence. And uh, what he did 
had to be um, um, endorsed by his father who uh, was in heaven. So let's walk around the scripture a bit. It says, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus' response was, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now, notice that Jesus does not call her mother. He says, woman, but there's no disrespect there because in the original Greek, uh, the word uh, is also lady. See? But the expression, my hour has not yet come, is what changes everything here. Because there's a difference that he is making uh, between uh, family relationship, his relationship with family, and his relationship uh, with his Father God. Jesus, he wanted to emphasize uh, that there was a different relationship now as regards uh, his ministry and his purpose in the earth. Uh, my hour has not yet come, which is a direct reference uh, to his ministry and his purpose in the earth. You all will remember that uh, of an incident recorded in Mark's Gospel, um, where Jesus' mother and uh, his brothers, his brothers, yes, they came to see him while he was ministering to uh, the multitude there. So his disciples came to him and said, um, Lord, your mother and your brothers, they seek after you. And this is what he, you know, said in reply. Who is my mother or my brethren? For whosoever, and he answers, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. So, there again, he was emphasizing that there was a different relationship. Even uh, when you uh, involve uh, uh, your own natural family, there was a different relationship uh, between uh, family and going about doing the business of the kingdom, doing the will of God, uh, you know, fulfilling uh, your ministry purpose in the earth. Uh. So there's got to be, he was saying, that sense of distance uh, between family relationships and your relationship with God. Uh. That is why, my friend, uh, the church family is a higher relationship than your natural family. Yes, because uh, you will remember uh, Jesus said that there is not, uh, not going to be any kind of family relationships in heaven. There is not going to be brother and sister uh, as we know them in the natural and husband and wife and so on. Nothing like that. Uh, you see, it is the family of God, uh, the church, that will be our brothers and sisters in heaven and uh, for eternity. And uh, although I know that may sound like punishment to some people, you know, let me let me assure you that heaven will be a great place. Yes, it will be. Uh, now that sense of distance, of differentiation between uh, uh, family relationships and your ministry and your relationship with God, that is exactly what jesus uh, would have been referring to in mark's gospel hear what he said there's no man that had left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time 
houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. So that sense of distance, that uh, sense of distinction, you know, becomes apparent uh, when Jesus uh, says to his mother, woman, my hour has not yet come. And the implication was this, uh, that no human being, not even his own mother, could determine what and when he did anything at all as far as his ministry and his purpose on earth were concerned. Now, another time Jesus says, I do nothing of myself. What I see the Father do, I do. What I hear the Father say, I see. So, everything that Jesus did was, just be, was because he saw the Father do it, and everything that he said is because he heard the Father say it. No, no human being, not even his mother, could change that. Yet, we can not, you know, miss at all the power of influence of his mother because this is what she tells the servants. After she got that response from Jesus, she says to the servants, whatever he says to you, you do it. That's a faith statement, my friend. She trusted in Jesus' ability to do something there. She trusted that whatever he says, it will work. She had that faith in him. So, obviously, he would have consulted with his father in heaven, and uh, the father would have endorsed uh, Mary's faith uh, and uh, given Jesus the go-ahead, uh, the, the green light uh, to uh, do something uh, to solve the situation and uh, by turning water into wine about the wine running out situation. So Jesus, he now says to the servants, fill the water pots with water. And the Bible says they fill them right up to the brim. Now you will understand very well the dynamics that are playing out behind Mary's desperate but radical faith because uh, because of the the culture's emphasis on the hospitality you'd realize that running out of wine would bring great great shame upon the family uh, because the bride's family their responsibility in the whole matter was to pay and support a seven-day party where all the guests could eat and drink as they well pleased in abundance and they were to eat and drink not only honey and milk but also with um, meat and wine so the wine running out is a major major catastrophe because the party stops when the wine stops and uh, when that happens the good times are rolling no more the marriage is in jeopardy and the family faces public humiliation and embarrassment uh, but in the middle of it all in the middle of the crisis uh, take a look at the the model of womanhood that we see in mary now most likely she is made aware of the wine running out um, from the women who are really engaged in the food preparation. And Mary, she is aware, and no doubt uh, she would have been a close friend or even family. No one knows. See, so she would have known that there was no money to buy more wine. 
the family couldn't afford it and uh, nobody could fix it and uh, um, there's what is scaring uh, uh, you know scaring her is a major fiasco that was going to take place in that little town of Kena but in the middle of the problem she makes a decision she says to herself I know someone I can talk to someone who can fix this problem you see she realizes that a family's name is about to go down the drain and as I said a while ago a family that she probably would have known very very well and she realizes that uh, human hands could not have solved the, the, the problem then, but she knew someone that she could talk to. So she decides to talk to Jesus. So thank God for mothers who know how to talk to Jesus. Thank God for a mother who knows how to pray. Thank God for praying mothers. Thank God for mothers who can talk to Jesus. One of the greatest things that God gives to us, my friend, is a praying mother. Mothers who know how to talk with Jesus. Mothers who realize that the prayer of a mother can guide a child. It can lift a child it can direct a child it can change a child see the prayer for mother it can do all of that and uh, and mothers who realize that there's no greater gift that god has given to them as a woman of influence than the ability to pray for your children yes now, as a matter of fact, let me prove that to you right now. Because there are people here today who would readily acknowledge this. Because you can declare unconditionally that, uh, and say that I am where I am today in my life. I am where I I am in the kingdom today because I had a mother who would go on her knees and call up on God and pray for me day after day. So thank God that you had a praying mother and thank God that she prayed for you. Now, I am a living example a living testimony of a praying mother who prayed for me day after day for years. I remember my wild years as a young adult when my mom would uh, come to me on a Sunday and say, son, come to church with me. And uh, I still remember very, very vividly you know, the, the, the emotions of deep anger that I will carry when she said that to me, even thinking that she would have the gall to even ask me to come to church. And all through those years, she suffered my rejection quietly, quietly, but my mom, she kept on asking. She never stopped. She kept asking me to go to church with her. And she kept on praying for me until bingo. The Lord, he cornered me on my proverbial Damascus road. And he gloriously saved me in my mid-30s. Yes, I got saved late o'clock yes and all of that happened because of a praying mama so thanks mom happy mother's day
Now, I have got to look back since then, uh, and uh, here I, I am today, a sinner above all sinners, yes, but washed in the precious blood of the Lamb, privileged and graced by Almighty God uh, to do something like this today, preaching to guys like you, tremendous people like you this morning. What a great privilege. Uh, that's the awesome power of a praying mom, my friend. Uh, so I am so glad uh, that my mama prayed for me. Yes, yes, a praying mother can change a child. Hallelujah. So here Mary is, you know, dealing with her grown-up miracle child. Uh, but he has not proved his power as yet. But she knows who he is. There is absolutely no doubt at all in her mind. Now, she knows that she never slept with Joseph nor any other man when she was betrothed to, to him. Yet, she became pregnant with child. Pregnant of the Holy Ghost. So, she knows that her pregnancy was sealed by the Holy Ghost. When the child was born, the angels declared it. The shepherds came and confirmed it. Hear what the Bible says. Shepherds made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. So yes, she knows who he is. She knew that John the Baptist had said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And she knew that there was a voice that came from heaven on the day of his water baptism, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So if there was anybody, you see, who knew who Jesus was, and what he was able to do was Mary. But up to that point, he had nothing to show for it because he had not done anything at all. And, uh, you know, I, I want to say this. Because there are some mothers here this morning. You know the frustration of a child who has not lived up to their possibilities as yet. You know and believe in their potential and in their possibilities, but they are yet to perform what they are able to do. And uh, I want to speak to some mother here this morning. When you are frustrated about a child, a child who has not lived up to what God says uh, that child could do and what uh, that child could be. The greatest gift that you can give to that child is not an angry voice, is not an argumentative spirit, is not a condemnatory tone of voice uh, or a feeling of uh, resignation and uh, hopelessness and finality. The greatest gift that you can give to that child is to pray for him, pray for her. It's not the beating and the spanking and the quarreling and the punishment that moves them, you know. It's your loving care and discipline and correction watered down with loads and loads of passionate, heartfelt prayer for them. So the Bible says that Mary brought the problem to Jesus and uh, I hope you catch this you know because this is the wild path. She comes to him and tells him they have 
no wine. But she knows, she knows who he is. She knows that he can fix it. But he might, you know, this is what uh, uh, is more or less being suggested in the text. So he replies, but mom, did you say wine? Yes, I did. They have no wine. Now, I want you to remember that this is Jesus' first miracle. And up to that point in time, he has not done anything as yet as far as his potential, his possibilities, his ministry are concerned. To th 30 years old, yes, 30 years old and done nothing as yet. Yet his mother believes in what he can do in spite of what he hasn't done. So the real, real gift of a mother is to have the belief, a belief that says, I believe in pres present possibilities despite uh, past performance. What my child has not done does not limit uh, what my child could do. And uh, what I'm saying here is not only for uh, teenage, teenagers here today, you know, because there are some mothers with grown children and uh, what they really need uh, are mothers who are in their corner and uh, who believe that they are able Mothers who believe that their children, they can. Mothers who support their children's dreams and hopes. Mothers who pray for courage and progress and good success for their children. Mothers who would say, it does not matter what your resume says. I know what God declares you to be. And I know what God declares you to be. So despite what is written on that resume, I know your potential. I would encourage you. I would support you. I would stand by you regardless of what you have not done because I believe in what you can do. So let's look at the progression of things uh, so far. The, uh, Mary comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, they have no wine. Jesus replies, that has nothing, what has that to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Mary's response, servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Jesus says to the servants, fill the water pots with water. So a God, here we are seeing that a godly mother not only exerts her influence within her family, but also outside her family too. Servants, she has influence on them. That tells me, and listen to me well, that you could be a woman uh, or, or sorry you could be a mother and uh, uh, yet childless yet childless yes and you can still be a mother because uh, get this what defines you as a godly mother is not that you have been in the delivery room but it is the realization that God has given you influence to change circumstances and children and classrooms and boardrooms and change not only environments, but the people who operate within those environments as well. Because you realize that God has given to you something to change the people around you. You have the gift of influence. And uh, although I'm speaking, you know, 
primarily to mothers this morning. You must know that as born-again believers in Christ, we all have the gift of influence as well, and it is called the ministry of the Word of God. We are the only people of hope given the message of hope, which is called the good news of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And inbuilt in that gospel, inbuilt in that good news, is God's power unto salvation to change lives and to heal. Yes, to radically put people in, a, in the opposite direction. So, if you use that power of influence to uh, start changing lives around you, you see that mentoring spirit, that mothering spirit, that fathering spirit, that shepherding spirit, that uh, uh, parenting spirit uh, would reach many, many, many in our churches and in our workplaces and right across uh, society today, my friend. Uh, so Mary says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. In other words, go talk to Jesus and listen to what he tells you. So a good mother influences people around her to have a conversation with Jesus uh, and to listen to what he says to them. In other words, a good mother influences her children to pray. She leads them to a place where they know how to talk to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can start off simply with, you know, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. Then you graduate them to our Father who art in heaven. See, thy kingdom come. And then you promote them to something like Heavenly Father, the God and Lord of my Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, you've got to get them in that kind of trajectory because in every child's life, there's going to come a time when the wine runs out. You see, the good times will stop. The easy life will come to an end. The party will be over and the storms will come. Problems will knock on every side. Sickness will be there. And if you have not taught them to pray, if you have not equipped them for life, you would have left those kids that you love naked and defenseless and vulnerable against their enemies because it is only when you make the Lord your shepherd that he is able to prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Hallelujah. But we spend so much time teaching them how to kick a football, how to look nice and how to dress nice, how to handle decimals and add fractions and read correctly, how to build a career and climb the corporate ladder, but we fail to give them the greatest tool that they will ever, ever need in life. For you see, when the wine runs out in their lives, when the wine runs out in your life, you better know how to pray, my friend. You better know how to fall on your knees and to have a talk with Jesus. So mothers, fathers, hear me now. Teach your children how to pray. Hallelujah. So there goes principle number one. Teach them 
how to pray. Principle number two, teach them how to obey. This is what Mary says to the servants. Whatever he tells you, do it. So, you know, if the Lord tells you to be patient, do it. If he tells you to worship, do it. If he says give, do it. If the Lord says forgive, do it. If he says, do you stay in that marriage? Do it. If he says, well, walk away, do it. If he says, you get involved in church, do it. If he says, you have to do more to reach the lost, you do it. If he says, whatever your hands find to do, do it. Well, obviously, do it because when the lord directs your heart you ought to be in a position to be obedient to what he has called you to do you know there's a saying i heard if the lord says to you you see that mosquito that mosquito can pull that truck over there you hook up that mosquito. <laughs> it may look crazy. It may sound crazy. People around you may have difficulty understanding it. They, they may not support it. But you hope against hope and learn to obey. Train up your child within a culture of obedience to God, my friend, so that when God says something, they will obey him because God will always do what he says he will do. Hallelujah. Now, so as foolish as it may have sounded to them, do you realize that there would have been no miracle at all if the servants, they had not obeyed? So, number one, Mary told them to Talk to Jesus to pray. Number two, to obey him. Number three, she tells them, I want you to trust him. Question, when does the water become wine? Because there's no verse that tells us that at some particular point, the water became wine. So when does the miracle really happen? Does it happen the moment they fill the jars? Does it happen when Jesus spoke? Did it happen when they drew it out to serve it? Nobody knows. But this much we know, you know, that when it gets to Jesus, this is the principle here, when it gets to Jesus, it becomes exactly what it needs. You see, by the time, this is what we know, by the time the chief um, steward tastes, uh, tastes, uh, you know, um, the, the, what is uh, served him, the Bible says that the water had already become wine. You know, that tells me that there are times when you do not know when the Lord is going to do it. You do not know what he will use and how he is really going to work it out. But in those moments, you have to learn to trust the Lord. Trust that God will do what he says he will do. Trust the Lord that he will make a way when there is no way. Trust the Lord that he has it all under control because he is able to keep that, is, that which is committed unto him against that day. When you do not understand what is going on, you still trust him. And when you trust God, you will find out a few things, my friend. 
because when the master of the feast when he drank the wine hear what he declared i have been to a number of parties and they always start with top shelf you know the best the good wine and then later on when everybody begin to feel happy when everybody begin to feel good and you know it's in the bible here what uh, it says when the guests have well drunk yes when they begin to feel good it is at that time that they bring out the inferior wine the low bottom stuff but the chief steward says this is not, not happening here this is the best wine that i've ever had you've kept the best for the last so you see when you trust god you will find out that what god brings to you is better than what you had uh, that when you put it all in god's hands uh, and you trust him with everything in your life uh, that what he gives to you is always better than what you had uh. so the lord uh, he tells the servants to fill the uh, uh, six stone jars that were there fill them with water and uh, the bible says that each one um, had a capacity of between 20 to 30 gallons each. Now, your know, Matt would tell you that Jesus, he transformed somewhere between 120 and 130 gallons of water into wine. <laughs> That's a whole, whole lot of wine. You see, here we see that Jesus, he makes more wine than the party really needs because this is the principle. When you trust God, not only will he give you better than what you had, he'll give you more than what you need. You remember those 12 baskets that remained after he fed the 5,000 plus? And there's somebody here today who can testify really testify of god's abundance in your life a god who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think you see god he always gives you more than you need so mary tells them i want you to talk to jesus pray i want you to obey him I want you to trust him. And finally, here's the next thing. A godly mother, how a godly mother influences others around her. Pray, obey, trust, and uh, finally give thanks. Notice, when the master of the feast drinks the wine and he realizes the quality of the wine he does not know where it came from he is blessed but he does not know the source of his blessing you see the bible um, says this the lord maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust so the master of the feast he's got better than what he had but he doesn't know where it came from so he begins to thank the bridegroom but the servants they knew that the blessings they knew that that wine did not come from the bridegroom they knew that it came from Jesus and here this my friend we are God's servants on the earth today. We are the church of the true and the living God. And we are called to go and tell all men the true source of God's blessings upon their life. You see, as I uh, read a while ago, God maketh the rain um, 
he, he sent the rain on the just as well as the unjust. He make the sun to rise on the evil and to the good. So people, they are blessed. But they do not know the source of their blessings. And because they do not know, they are giving thanks to the wrong one. Because they do not know who it is, the true and the living God, they are giving thanks to the bridegroom. So they think that it is Krishna, they think that it is Buddha, they think that it is Muhammad, they even think that it is Mary. But we have to go and tell them the truth about who their praise ought to be directed to. That the God of all eternity, he came down from heaven and became a human being to die for the sins of all mankind. And his name is Jesus. And he alone is worthy of all of our praise. He is Savior, he is Lord, and he is Miracle Walker. And one of the greatest things you can do as a mother of godly influence is to teach your children to acknowledge the goodness of God in their lives. Our text ends like this. This beginning of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee. Now in the Greek, the word beginning there means the first of more to come. So, God is just getting started with you, my friend. It's going to be better. It's going to get better from here on. That is what God is saying to you this morning. I know that your life and everything around you, that they are telling you the opposite of what God is saying here. But Jesus said, that he can fill your empty jars with new wine of joy and goodness and peace and blessings and prosperity and health and every good thing that you need. And he reassures us that he is with us right down to the end of the age. He tells us that His grace is sufficient. And if we endure unto the end, He will give to us to rule with Him with a rod of iron. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, talk to Jesus. Obey Him. Trust Him. Give him praise. Thank him. Because it is just the beginning of what God is going to do in your life. Hallelujah. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Let us bow in prayer. Father God, I thank you for women of influence whom we call mothers. Those who will rise above the challenges of everyday life. Those who will acknowledge possibility instead of past performance. Lord, those mothers who pray and they teach their children to pray. Mothers who teach their kids to obey you and to trust in you and to give you thanks and be grateful. Lord, this morning, we all here can be a witness of your goodness and blessings in our lives because of mothers who loved us, who cared for us, and invested in us. So I ask, mighty God, that you will strengthen the hearts 
of all our mothers here. Strengthen them, God, those mothers who will raise their children, natural children and spiritual children to obey you and to live their lives every day in the glory of Almighty God. We ask it done for your honor and for your glory. Amen and amen and amen. And if you will stand for the blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen and amen and amen. God richly bless you. Enjoy your special day. See you next week.